Thank you, Scott. And if you'd now take a seat, and I'll ask our panellists to come up to the stage and I'll introduce them uh, as they come and sit down. Uh, it's important that you know what they do and what their interests are. But uh, thank you, Scott, in particular, for that uh, introduction to, well, to the science, but also to what uh, AR5 contains. Can I introduce uh, from your left, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Neville Nichols, who works in the School of Geography and Environmental Science at Monash University. Neville was a coordinating lead author on the IPCC's special report on climate change and extreme events that was released last year. Neville is also the immediate past president of AMOS. Neville's expertise includes natural climate variability and prediction, especially uh, the El Nino, the monitoring of climate and weather extremes, and the impacts of weather and climate on human health, agriculture, and ecosystems. Next to uh, Neville is Dr. Penny Wetton. Uh, many of you have seen Penny over recent years on uh, television talking about climate science. Penny is a senior principal research scientist in the climate projection science team at CSIRO Marine and Atmospheric Research. Penny is a lead author of Chapter 25 of Working Group 2's report, Australasia, that is due out in March next year. Penny was also a lead author of two previous IPCC Working Group 1 assessment reports, the third and fourth assessment reports, on chapters concerning regional climate change. Penny's expertise includes regional climate change projections, particularly how climate is likely to change over Australia and impacts of climate change over Australia. Scott Power, you've met. Uh, Julie Arblaster, uh, Dr. Julie Arblaster is a senior research scientist at the Centre for Australian Weather and Climate Research at the Bureau of Meteorology. Julie is a lead author of chapter 12 of the report, Long-Term Climate Change, Projections, Commitments and Irreversibility. She's co-editor of IPCC Working Group 1, Annex 1, the Atlas of Global and Regional Climate Projections. And finally, on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the table, is Dr. Malte Meinshausen. Uh, Malte is Honorary Senior Research Fellow in the School of Earth Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Malte is also a Senior Researcher at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in Germany. And the Potsdam Institute is one of the world's foremost climate research institutions. Uh, Molly's expertise includes carbon budgets and emission trajectories, especially how the uncertainties in the climate system science translate into probabilities of achieving or not achieving certain climate targets like plus two degrees centigrade. Now we have a number of questions uh, for them and I have some, uh, some primers. The first one I was going to ask you Scott, and this is not the one we talked about earlier. <laughs> so I apologise for that. Why did we choose plus two? What's so critical about plus two? Probably this microphone on. It's not. It's not. It will be. Try again. Give it a tap. Not the hammer you were talking about that you're banging things with in the presentation, but uh, Penny's probably the person to ask. Can you hear okay up the back? Yeah. yeah. yeah Penny's probably the person to ask about this because it has a bearing on the impacts of climate change and their severity. Have a go ahead. <laughs> well, certainly all of the impacts of climate change become more and more severe as you increase the... Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Um, clearly all of the impacts of climate change become more and more severe as you increase the amount of warming. It's, um, and many of them become um, you know, much more significant above two degrees, but it's, it's, it's really just a convenient marker. Um, you know, there are, there are certainly impacts that become quite serious at lower levels of warming, such as uh, the threats to coral reefs, reefs which are uh, quite significant at perhaps only a one degree of warming, whereas there are some other impacts that, that may kick in at higher levels of warming. It's, it's just taking into account a whole range of impact areas. It's, it's a reasonably convenient target level to focus on. Okay, let me go back to what I was going to ask. Scott about, which was just to, just to highlight again, Scott, then the, the big advancements that have been made in this assessment report compared to the one from 2007. Uh, there's quite a long list, but some of it is that the influence of humans on the climate system is now more obvious along, across a wider range of elements of the climate system, for example. Uh, so it's, it's what I said was that the influence of humans is, is clear now. Um, 
what else? We've had more data sets to, to look at. The models have got uh, better than they used to be. Um, yeah, there's a couple of Oh, one, and I guess the other one is that to highlight this important point that the warming that is projected to occur is primarily a function of the total amount of carbon that's been released all the way back to the Industrial Revolution. I think that's a big step forward as well. Mark, uh, it, there is consensus among scientists, we're told. Um, Multi-year experience in Stockholm, though, uh, the, the, the process of getting governments to agree to this fifth assessment report, you can shed a bit of light on that, uh, on what was happening at the meeting in Stockholm? Yeah, I have a... <laughs> He's organised. Um, yeah, so the Stockholm meeting was now just about to agree between, uh, I think 110 governments turned up, between those governments to agree the final language of the summary for policy makers. Now, you could first see that maybe, hey, what does, what do governments have to do about the scientific uh, scientists' work? But it is really to get um, kind of ownership of this report by the government. And once you get Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia and um, Europe and the U.S. and China agreeing on these summary key points, then there's no point for these governments, or there's no legitimacy anymore to kind of derail the report as this is a bunch of nonsense. These governments now agree to that language and agree to it that, that makes sense to portray it in that way. But obviously, there is um, a number of ways how you can reflect the science that is there. And just one key example that was just mentioned is the key attribution statements that we humans, we are responsible and it, or it's extremely likely that we are responsible for more than half of the observed warming. Now this is the statement that was preferred by, for example, China. And it is still there, but we have now another formulation that is equally valid, which is our best estimate is that the human contribution is as much as observed, meaning there are no other known causes that could have caused the warming over the last 50 years. And so you see there these both these sentences that we it's extremely likely that we cause more than half, or our best estimate is really it's just as humans full stop period. Um, this is two ways of reflecting the same science. Two the two sentences are equally valid, and this is what governments said, uh, then fight about. Um, should we rather have the one sentence or the other? In this sentence, in this instance, we have both of them in there. Everybody can choose and pick, and that's how governments agree. And I'd, I'd just like to say that, you know, Scott and I have slaved over this report for many, many hours and um, we try and, and the, the report reflects the science, uh, our assessment of our understanding of the science. But then the governments do come in and they, they can't change the science, but they can change the way that it's communicated. And that's a good thing because our scientists aren't always the best communicators. But the science is, is definitely in there based on what our scientific knowledge is. Well, it's eventually just how likely are these changes in global temperatures over coming years? Uh, so the IPCC report has very specific language that um, de describes our confidence and our understanding of the likelihood of changes. And so under these different scenarios that Scott uh, mentioned, um, it's likely that uh, in the low emission scenario where we really do a lot of mitigation that will stay below this two degrees above pre-industrial. Um, but if we go for the higher emission scenarios, it's likely that we'll exceed that two degrees. And the highest emission scenario, it's even um, likely that we'll exceed four degrees. Thank you. Now, Neville, we haven't heard from you and I want to, because I, and I, without being rude, I want to just perfectly extend the time frame a little. You've had a long experience working with IPCC. What's your understanding, or what, or what can you tell us about, you know, what's changed since the first report to now? What are, what are, the, what are these uh, IPCC assessments? What's the difference between observed and projected changes over the last decade, for example? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, one of my colleagues has described me as a veteran uh, IPCC <laughs> contributor. Uh, I hadn't realised that uh, I was in veteran of anything uh, thus far, <laughs> but uh, I've taken it on board. Uh, one of the big things for me, and Scott didn't really address this, um, probably thought I was going to be here and address it anyway, was the changes in the way we have assessed, observed changes in extremes and projected changes in extremes. Like, 
We've known for a long time, since before I became a scientist, back in the 1950s and 1960s, that increasing amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was going to lead to an increase in global mean surface temperature. And people were making, scientists were making predictions of that in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. But even by the time you got to the first couple of um, assessment reports from the IPCC in 1990 and 1995, not much is said about extremes. And uh, there's a statement in the 1995 second assessment report saying that that's basically because data are poor and few and analyses are very, very um, short and not, there haven't been enough analyses to actually talk about whether extremes are changing as a result of, of human activity. Now that started to change in the third assessment report, the fourth assessment report did more, and then since the fourth assessment report in 2007, basically five years of work has gone in in the IPCC in assessing a large increase in, in literature on extremes and changes in extremes. And, and we've gone to a much more nuanced picture of how extremes have been changing and how much of those changes can be attributed to human activity and our projections of changes in the future. Uh, so I can go into details on that if we've got a little bit of time. Let, let's get some other views on a couple of other things. The other important thing that, that I don't know a lot about, but uh, and perhaps Malta, you might pick this up, is this lag effect in the atmosphere. I don't think it's well understood that um, the, the carbon dioxide, in, in fact, will keep warming for, for years and years and years. And I don't think that's generally understood. Can you take us through that science or someone else? I think it was excellently mentioned already in the um, first presentation. Um, we have this cumulative budget of a thousand gigatons to stay below two degrees. Well, why is that? Why can there be a budget after all? It can't be for other short-lived greenhouse gases. Like if you take methane, for example, it has a lifetime around a decade, and then okay, it goes into CO2, but then it's gone. So you could emit methane for a very, very long time, and the induced warming depends on the rate of emission in any given decade or something. But with CO2, it's really that cumulative effect. And that's because CO2 does not have A, a finite lifetime. It does not have a um, sink where it is destroyed, it's just redistributed to the oceans and the terrestrial biosphere. So as part of that equilibrium, there's always going to be around 20%, maybe 15% in the very long term, sticking around in the atmosphere, causing to continuous warming over maybe a thousand year time frame. And that's why we have a budget. So, And this is nicely fleshed out in the near report. And having a budget is uh, then which follows from the property of CO2 is kind of nice because we politicians they are used to budgets <laughs> the problem is politicians are used to overdrawing budgets <laughs> um, but following from budget is that there is no way around of us going towards zero emissions at some point in the future if we want to stop the climate system to warm and warm and warm. So this phase out of emissions to an absolute zero level, near zero, and um, this is kind of enshrined in these budget as well. And uh, this is just starting to kick in in the uh, debate and in the mindset of people. But the point is, if we went to zero emissions today, the atmosphere is going to continue to warm for a period. It doesn't just stop because you stop emitting. Is that? Um, I, I can take that. Have a go. Maybe. Yeah. Help me. Um, yeah, even if we stopped emitting CO2 today, which is really impossible, um, but if we did, uh, we definitely get, um, we have this commitment in the system and so there'd be another, um, another amount of warming and this would also translate for multiple centuries of sea level rise that we're committed to. And so in the report they, they talk about if we do try and reduce our temperatures down to this two degree, two degree target, we'd still get another metre of sea level rise. Um, by 2300, but if we keep emitting on this higher emission scenario, it could be um, as much as three metres of additional sea level rise by 2300. You want to make comments? Go, Scott. Yeah, sure. On, on the temperatures, it's, um, 
Right. Where we can, if we stop emissions, really, then we first have that big spike of warming because of the aerosols are not masking anymore. But then, in the very long term, they are going to be reduced. So, but that's right. Yeah. Very so, in that that low emission scenario, if we if we do start declining by the middle of this century, then we will have um, less global temperatures in the future. That would be a good thing. Just got to go ahead. Are we allowed to ask questions? Whatever you like. So I had a question for Neville because he was he's a, one of the world's leading authorities on uh, climate change and extremes. I was wondering if you could say something about tropical cyclones, but also how so I think sometimes people think that we're saying that anthropogenic for, forcing or anthropogenic induced changes to uh, greenhouse gas concentrations is going to change everything everywhere. Whereas um, maybe that needs clarification. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, tropical cyclones is an interesting one because I guess there are three categories. There are things we're actually pretty confident about, about changes in the future. Things like we're going to get more heat waves, they're going to be worse, they're going to kill more people. And then there are things which we know are going to change but we can't actually predict how they're going to change. And then there are things which we think we're probably beyond ever our capacity to, to actually talk about how they might change. Things like tornadoes, I suspect. And tropical cyclones is probably in the middle. I have no doubt that global warming is going to affect tropical cyclones, but the problem is our models aren't very good at representing tropical cyclones. Our physical understanding about how they interact with the global climate system is probably still a little bit rudimentary, and so we, we just don't have the confidence to actually make projections with great confidence about how tropical cyclones might change in the future. We've got problems with even looking back in the past about tropical cyclones, about how many they are and how many how intense they are. And you can see that in both this report in the AR5 and in previous reports over the last decade, that there's a lot of uncertainty about how tropical cyclones might change in the future. And that's what I was pointing out. But our understanding of how extremes might change has become more nuanced over the last 10 years, but it's not that the world's just going to get, everything's going to get more extreme. Some extremes are going to get worse, and we're really very confident of heat waves, hot days, fewer cold nights, um, reasonably confident about uh, uh, some increase in intense rainfall events. But then there are a lot of other things, including tropical cyclones, but not just restricted tropical cyclones, but we really struggle with at the moment. And we really need to improve a big, a dramatic in improvement in our understanding of the climate system and how it interacts with these smaller scale phenomena before we can make confidence prediction, confident predictions. I think you can come in here, Penny. Yeah, look, talk, talking on the topic of confidence and predictions, you will often hear that, um, oh, we don't have quite as much certainty about how climate will change at the regional scale in the future. And, and in our case, we're particularly interested in Australia. There's, there's actually a lot of certainty um, down to that local scale. Um, well, we certainly know that Australia is going to warm, um, is projected to warm in the future at a rate very similar to those global rates of warming we saw on, on the Scott's graph earlier, um, in the high emission phase up to um, five degrees. In fact, more than that in inland areas, areas of Australia because all continental areas tend to warm faster than the global average. The coastal areas are a little less than the coastal average. Rainfall changes, though, um, are an area where um, we have a little less confidence um, in the statements we can make, but really as the science has been evolving, and it's clear in the latest um, IPCC report, the picture I think is becoming clearer for regional rainfall changes, um, at least in some areas of the world, including affecting some parts of Australia. I think there's, um, what we see um, in the projections for the future is a tendency for the uh, rainfall systems in the in southern Australia, the, the cold fronts that come across in the western is particularly in winter, and bring rainfall to southern areas of Australia, particularly to southwest western Australia, but also to say the Adelaide area and stretching into, into Victoria. Um, we see those systems becoming weaker and moving further south and projected decreases in rainfall in those areas. And we see that from multiple lines of evidence, um, and in fact it's what we have seen in the in the world over the last last few decades, particularly in South West Western Australia. So there is a reasonably clear picture emerging for future rainfall changes for that part of Australia. Um, it's not as clear if you look elsewhere in Australia where the messages at the moment are still a little bit more mixed, possibly 
no change in rainfall patterns, although some models still show the risk of quite significant increases or decreases. I see, uh, Julie, can you follow on? There's a, I think you did mention sea level, and I noticed that there are, that there are different uh, expectations in this report than, uh, than the previous assessed report, and for a country like Australia, and we already know that the potential uh, impact of increased sea level uh, can be, well, you know, very, very important. But the, the range has been increased this time. Yeah, that's right. So, um, as Scott was talking about, um, we have had increase in sea level rise, the rate of sea level rise in the last uh, 20 years. And um, the fourth assessment report was sort of criticised by some for not including changes in sea level rise in the future due to um, these dynamic changes in the ice sheets, so the um, big ice sheets sort of carving off and going into the ocean. And, and at the time there wasn't felt that there was enough of the peer-reviewed literature to really assess how much that would contribute to future sea level rise. But in the fifth assessment report there is um, uh, an estimate from that component. So most of the sea level rise in the future, or a large part of it, is from just the warming of the oceans that expands the oceans and lifts the sea level. Um, but in the future, we'll also potentially have glacier and, and ice sheet melt. And so that's why the projections of sea level rise are, are higher in this fifth assessment report. Um, whilst you're there, I, I mentioned this milestone that we've sort of adopted of plus two. The other milestone that we seem to have adopted is 2000, well, the, the year 2100. What happens after that? <laughs> yeah, good point. Climate change doesn't stop at 2100. Um, and this is the first report from the IPCC that actually did look at projections beyond 2100. Um, and so we've, we've got some climate model runs now that go to 2300, which is a long, long time in the future. But uh, I guess that was the point Malte and, and I were making before, is that we are really committed to, to long-term changes in the climate system. But um, as Scott showed, we can really make a difference if we um, choose a, a low emissions scenario going forward. That can change the rate of sea level rise in this century and, and also beyond. You, a couple of you have mentioned certainty, and I believe that in this report the certainty of the, of the, of the findings has increased from about, say, 90% to about 95%. I've heard people talk about that being as the equivalent of we're about as certain of uh, this science as we are that uh, cigarettes can kill us or that the, the, the planet's 13.8 billion years old. How do, is that because of improvements in technology that you mentioned, Scott? How have we got the increased certainty? And, and can you talk to us about scientific certainty? Who wants to have a crack at that? Because I think it's important to understand. I'll look that over. Well, I can start and the others can chip in. Uh, yeah, the, as Julie mentioned before, in the IPCC report, we use what we refer to as calibrated uncertainty language. So every time you see the words like likely, very likely, almost certain, they actually correspond to a, a probability in the opinion of the, um, the authors. And that's based on a wide range of uh, factors. So it's in, based on how much evidence do you have, the quality of that evidence, the degree of consistency uh, of that evidence. And so if you had all of those things, lots of evidence, high quality evidence, complete agreement, then you would have high confidence in whatever statement you're trying to make. And I think part of the reason, but others may want to chip in, why the uh, confidence in that particular statement has increased is because we've got longer data sets, we've got wider data sets, um, we're seeing the changes over a much, over a broader range of important elements of the climate system. You might remember that plot I put up, a little cartoon plot that showed the little arrows for about 10 different things. So you can see that all of these changes um, point to a warming planet, and then you see things like we've got these, these latest generation of climate models, better than they've been previously. The only way we can, uh, the only way that these models simulate the accelerated warming that's been observed is if we put in greenhouse gases. So there's some of the reasons why confidence has increased, but there, others may want to... Can we expect it to continue to increase? You know, if we do another report in five years' time, will the certainty increase to 97.5% or something like that? Can we expect to continue to get more valid data? I work for the Bureau, so I don't make any predictions in this <laughs> <afternoon>. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Look, could I follow up on, on that general point? Uh, like that, that's also one of the big differences in the way IPCC reports and assessments have evolved over the last uh, 12 or so years. Is that it's attempt to be much more transparent in why and how the authors assess a certain level of confidence or certainty or uncertainty in, in any particular uh, assess part of the assessment. And so they've also, they're, they're also very explicit generally about being fairly conservative. So they will talk about the data sets and I'll say, well, the data sets might say, we think it's uh, very likely but we tone that down a bit because of uncertainties in the models or the data set, so we might tone that down to likely. And there are a couple of places in the AR5 when that sort of statement, that conservative statement, is made very explicitly. I make that point, and I make the point about the transparency because I think that the authors of, AR, of, of IPCC assessments over the last 12 or so years have tried very hard to get to the point where even if you disagree with our assessment, you'll at least understand exactly how we reach that assessment. And that transparency, I think, is, is rarely seen in science because it's really quite difficult to put that much detail into an assessment and that, in, of any sort of assessment or scientific paper. And I think that's a big step forward for IPCC and for public understanding of what the IPCC is doing and saying. Before we take some questions from the floor, and I have some uh, questions coming from Twitter, uh, Scott mentioned this uh, new special climate statement uh, for the September. It's useful for everybody here to, to uh, understand it. I might just take a moment to read it out. It was just issued yesterday. It said, Australia's record for the warmest 12-month period has been broken for a second consecutive month. This continues a remarkable sequence of warmer than average months for Australia since June 2012. September 2013 was easily Australia's warmest September on record. The national average temperature for September was plus 2.75 degrees above the long-term average, the same average that Scott mentioned, which also sets a record for Australia's largest positive anomaly for any monthly mean temperature. The previous record of plus 2.66 degrees was set in April 2005. The mean temperature for Australia, averaged over the 12 months from October 2012 to September 2013, was 1.25 degrees above the long-term average. This was also 0.17 degrees centigrade warmer than any 12-month period prior to 2013. The previous record set over September 2012 to August 2013 was 1.11 degrees centigrade above the long-term average, and the record preceding the current warm spell was 1.08 degrees centigrade set between February 2005 and January 2006. Temperatures for the calendar year to date, that's January to September, have also been the warmest on record at 1.31 degrees centigrade above the long-term average, well above the figure set for January to September 2005 of plus 1.07. 2005 currently holds the record though for the war Australia's warmest calendar year. What's the significance of these numbers of plus one, plus two now in these recent, I mean these are, my understanding is these are big, these are, these are big numbers in the, in the climatic record. Yes, they are, and um, certainly, with you know, without that background warming that Australia has been experiencing, we wouldn't be expecting to get um, years or months anything like this. Um, and unfortunately, it's a taste of what we're going to get more of in the future, um, particularly if we follow those higher emission pathways. Um, years or runs of months with those sorts of temperature anomalies are going to return more and more frequently in the future, and we're actually going to see even larger ones than that. Um, so it's certainly a taste of the future. It's also, it, it's hard, if, if you've lived in Australia over the last 12 months, it's hard to think that there's been a hiatus in warming. Uh, and in fact, if you look anywhere in the world, the last decade, we've seen um, unprecedented heat waves and unprecedented bushfires in, in the Americas, in Asia, in Europe, and Australia. They've killed thousands of people. So if this is a hiatus, a hiatus, God help us when warming kicks back in. Hmm. Now we'll take some questions from the floor. We have, I think, two or three microphones around the room. So can I identify the lady here in the lilac top in the first instance? Whilst the microphone's coming to you, uh, Malty, is a question from James Judd uh, from twi from, uh, via Twitter said, 
Could the energy taken out by solar and wind generation account for global warming levelling off? <laughs> well, that would be lovely. Uh, no, but unfortunately that's not the case. Um, we, we are having our emissions, uh, our foot firmly, we have that on the solar elevator. We have every year, we have more and more and more emissions. We know that we have to go down. We know that, especially with these carbon budgets that are shown, um, we have the, the socio-economic constraints of how fast we can rent down our emissions. So there's not much wiggle room before 2020 um, to level the emissions off. And frankly, we're just going in the other direction, especially with the boom in Chinese emissions, etc. So if that were really true, that with the solar and wind that saw a dramatic and very hopeful increase over the last years, if that were true that they would cause a ramp down of temperatures, then we would have seen a ramp down of total global emissions, but unfortunately we didn't. So, good idea, but unfortunately it's not the case. Now, just whilst you're there, I'm, I'm not delaying you intentionally, uh, Scott mentioned some feedback mechanisms on the planet, and there's one here, we've related this question here from, from Takfer. Uh, it, the question is, is fire a major climate feedback? How has it been considered in AR5? Well, but yeah, things get hotter, things dry out, things burn, and there's a feedback mechanism there, is, is there not? Um, so the models for the first time include a, 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 their earth system models, and so they do include these feedbacks um, from vegetation changes and, um, and carbon cycle. As for fires, I think um, that's fairly small scale, kind of, um, as far as the heat from fires, is, um, wouldn't be a big deal, but Penny might want to talk about the CO2 emissions? Well, certainly if there's an, an increase in, um, in forest fire, uh, there would be, uh, that would lead to some <coughs> further increase in CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. Um, so there is, there is some, some connection there. Now, your question, please let us know your name and, and if you represent anyone other than yourself and uh, have a question. My name is Liz Burton and uh, my question uh, relates to the geography of Australia which is 70% desert um, and the impact of this um, uh, potential for an increase in temperature of 2 degrees um, on the increase of desertification on Australia. About 85% of our uh, population lives outside of the desert and if we do achieve this 2 degrees um, what uh, extra desert might we get and how long would it take to get there? And the other um, part of my question relates to two degrees sounds fairly benign to most people and probably to policy makers and uh, governments. And I think that we need to perhaps explain exactly what two degrees means because it doesn't mean two degrees literally it's far more sophisticated than that. And can you explain that? Mm. Well, a couple of questions there. Uh, desertification, uh, as a, anyone want to have a crack at that? Um, well, certainly the, the projected changes in the future that we're seeing from the climate models, we see a, a warming and in the southern areas of Australia, probably a drying. Just to talk directly down it like an ice okay. cream. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the warm areas of Australia, southern areas of Australia, a um, a drying. In some models that drying is quite severe, but there's some uncertainty about that. That would certainly lead to a, a southward um, migration of the, um, the the desert climate, so to speak. Um, and in fact, it's not in the IPCC, but I'm aware of other, other recent research that does show that as a possibility. Um, so yes, there is a risk of that hotter and drier climate leading to a increase in, in, the, in the arid climates of southern Australia or a southward extent of those. Um, the focus on two degrees, I just want to mention that the IPCC report is not just talking about two degrees. We have, under that high emission scenario, ranges of warming between two and a half up to five degrees. Um, and so, you know, a, a five degree warming globally would actually mean more than that for inland areas of Australia. It's probably more like a six or a seven degree warming. And you can imagine what that would do to say, you know, now a record hot day may be 46 or 47 degrees. We're looking at 
52, 53 degrees in such a consequence situation. Of course, though, um, that's under the high emission pathway. If we are able to follow um, the lower emission pathway, we may be able to keep that warming below two and a half degrees, maybe possibly even below two degrees. And who would like to just put this question of what plus two degrees global mean means in terms of ranges? I mean, to, give, to put in it, to give it some reality. I mean, I understand. I mean, some people mean Melbourne. Well, means we're a bit like Sydney, does it? But it doesn't. Um, well, I can answer the first start of that. Um, so, I was once crossing the border between the US and Canada, and the, the customs guy asked me to prove that I was a climate scientist, <laughs> and I used this this analogy that. Two degree, or f if you think of four degrees warming, which some of the projections are talking about, um, the last ice age that, that's got, uh, well, the last ice age uh, was really only four to nine degrees globally cooler than today. So, so four degrees is a big number globally, and, and as Penny was saying, that has really big consequences to our climate. Um, and so that seemed to, the customs officer was happy to let me through. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the, last interglacial when temperatures might have been something about two degrees warmer we saw a couple of meter higher sea level rise now there are some analogies that work some that don't for example the insulation was higher in the last inter interglacial and there are higher latitudes so the greenland ice sheet might have melted a bit quicker than it would have otherwise um, but still we have indications that two degrees of a long time frame can lead to a fairly different uh, phase of the planet um, one side note on the two degrees, two degrees is not the IPCC target, as was discussed. It's not the science that comes down to two degrees and that's the target. In fact, as Penny before mentioned, there's an array of thresholds and the more warming you have, the more surprises you have to expect and the more of the impacts you're going to see. And in fact, small island states and the international negotiations, they say, well, two degrees, that's too high for us. We are not going to um, have our islands here for another 100 years with a sea level rise that is projected. Um, we want to survive, and therefore they call for a 1.5 degree target. So it is important, it's a value judgment about where do you want to stop climate change. That value judgment has been done by most of the governments. Um, but it's not a value judgment that should come and can come from science. Penny? Yeah, look, two degrees is, is probably still very significant when it comes to natural ecosystems in Australia. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the threat that's posed to, to coral reefs. Well, two degrees would cause um, likely um, very frequent ble bleaching and, and likely death of coral, of coral reefs in the Australian region as well as elsewhere. Natural ecosystems, the distributions of plants and animals are, fairly, are usually fairly finely tuned to the climate we have today. Um, you warm up the climate by two degrees and all sorts of species would find that their preferred habitat has moved hundreds of kilometres across the landscape and to survive they will now need to be able to bridge that gap whether they can in our modern world where our natural ecosystems are so fragmented is another question. Could I, could I also elaborate? Um, I don't need that. <laughs> uh, look, when we talk about, say, two degrees warming or three degrees warming, it's global average. And it's nice to think about what that might do to Australia. And I, for very good reasons why we're, we're really interested in our local area and our local country. But we're going to get bigger warmings in the northern hemisphere, uh, the northern latitudes of the northern hemisphere. And that's going to have big consequences. And it's going to have consequences on Australia that are probably, far, in my opinion, probably far outweigh the local consequences of climate change. In the last 15 years, the amount, the aerial extent of country that's covered by snow in the Northern Hemisphere has declined by about a third. Um, about 3 million square kilometres are no longer covered by snow, which they were 15 years ago during this hiatus. Um, Arctic sea ice over about 15 years has declined um, the summer sea ice by about 20%. Uh, we're losing thousands of gigatons um, of ice uh, over from, from the Greenland ice shelf. All of the alpine glaciers are, are, are declining as well. The Russian Navy is now patrolling the northern uh, shipping routes. 
Um, there's likely to be a, a big geopolitical tussle between Canada and the US about passages through the Canadian islands. There are going to be major geopolitical consequences of that, which will have repercussions for Australia as well. So it's not, as much as I'm, I'm as interested as you are in desertification and ecosystems in Australia, but we shouldn't just completely focus on or think that the only consequences for Australia are going to be what happens to our climate here. It's also what's going to happen to the climate in the powerful nations in the northern latitudes of the northern hemisphere as well. That will have repercussions. Gentlemen in the third row. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Rob. Um, Barry Pullen and I work with the Brotherhood of St Lawrence uh, uh, trying to tease out the social impacts of climate change. My question follows from sort of the uh, issue before about where uh, the IPCC is heading and the trend. Uh, if I can make it particular, uh, the earlier reports mentioned the thing called the uh, uh, Kaya identity, which was interesting in the sense that it tried to connect uh, the whole process with population growth, uh, per capita uh, development uh, of the economy, the amount of energy that was then necessary to deliver that, and finally, uh, the implication then for the amount of greenhouse gases that resulted. And though I accept that's an imperfect and in some ways crude, but it was presented by the early IPC reports, are you going to explore those factors? Because governments, uh, don't struggle only because they don't understand the science or some particular people don't because they have some enormous other pressures on them and we don't have a debate about that but is that within the remit of the uh, IPCC or is it really too tough to tackle to get mixed up in those issues and point out the connections between those issues and our capacity to mitigate and, and take other actions? I think Malta's going to feel that. Could you pass the microphone to the gentleman immediately, or just almost behind? There we are. That's good. Malta, are you going to have a response to that? It's a very important area because after we all know here how the climate change system is going to change and what do we know about the past, the question is what do we do about it and how could one do something about it if one wanted to. And unfortunately, though, you have to be patient for another eight months before in April 2014, the third part of the IPCC comes out, and there the Kaya identity is discussed, and the different scenarios, like if you have very high population growth, if you have that type of energy uh, pickup of some technologies, etc., how does it affect the costs of meeting certain carbon budget of meeting certain pathways to half global emissions by 2050 or zero emissions by 2070, 2080, etc. And all this, these socio-economic parts are going to be fleshed out in great detail in April 2014. Yes. Um, Barry Pizok, uh, I thought it was former, uh, former lead author on IPCC, but I've sort of retired. Um, <laughs> I've had trouble right from the beginning with IPCC about communication and I think it's uh, quite explicitly uh, brought out in this report with the uh, definitions of uncertainty. Um, it, it says, for example, uh, unlikely is uh, a chance of 0 to 33 per cent. Well, uh, does that mean that uh, uh, there's nothing to worry about? And I think the, the, the critical point is that climate change is a matter of risk assessment. And what IPCC needs to be addressing is, is the risk. And its risk is probability times consequences. And if the consequence is uh, uh, one in three of a two metre rise in sea level by 2100, then that's important. And it ought to be communicated. And I think if you say it's very unlikely, uh, that doesn't really help. Um, so I'd, I'd really like to see that explained better. Um, Perhaps uh, it's in the language that IPCC has adopted, but maybe we've got to interpret it. We've got to interpret it now uh, in the media and uh, as advocates of doing something, that in fact uh, a one in 10 or a one in three chance of something uh, terrible happening is important and politicians and others should take note of it. Okay, whilst you're working out who's gonna answer that, and I think Penny was in the space, 
There's a gentleman I'm trying to identify who I sort of waved at a minute ago and sort of my two o'clock. Yes, that gentleman there. Can you have the microphone next, please? Who was I going? Penny, do you want to start on risk? We were talking about it earlier. Um, well, I think Barry expressed it very well. I, I don't have a, a lot to add. I, I think one of the... Um, Neville was mentioning earlier about the evolution in the use of very careful language in, in IPCC. Um, but I think perhaps one of the downsides of that is IPC has tended to focus on statements um, that it can make confidently, or with some fine level of confidence or likelihood, um, it, as a consequence, probably doesn't put enough emphasis on rare but possible events. And in fact, in actual fact, they are the things that you, you always have to look at when you're when you're managing um, issues or risky issues such as this. I mean, it's been said before. You don't you don't take out. Um, um, fire insurance, insurance on your house because you think it's likely it's going to burn down. You do it because um, it may burn down in a, in a, in a one in a hundred case. Um, so, you know, it's those, those rare, those warmings above five or even six degrees, which may be treated as low likelihood of, of, by IPCC. What they're also saying is that they are still possible and we need to actually um, look at those, particularly when we're planning our responses. Okay, now I'm going to ask you guys to keep your answers a bit shorter and I'm going to ask you guys to ask you to keep your questions a bit shorter. Gentleman here in the white t-shirt, then if we can get the microphone to the young lady in the front row. Next. Um, my name's Jack. Yep. Yeah, you, you, you persist. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, um, in the uh, IPCC report, was uh, my understanding of the IPCC defined um, pre-industrial level or the industrial revolution is occurring in 1750 um, and a lot of uh, the assessments about the, uh, temp the degree temperature rise were 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius and it was my understanding that those were from 1850 to 1900, the average there. And then in the AR4 report, a lot of the temperature increases are said to be in um, pre-industrial level rises. So I was wondering, with the limit, the two degree limit, is that pre-industrial relative to 1750? And then what the AR, and then in the AR4 reports, is that relative to 1750 or is that relative to 1850 to so, have, a go, have a go, Malti, and if you could just have a go that. Oh, oh, Scott, do you want to have a crack? Or Julie? Julie. We, well, they're all putting their head up. To the hour, stop on discussions, but you start. Oh. Yeah, so I guess in the, um, the temperature projections, you're right, in the AR5 are 1850 to 1900, and that's because the models, model runs that we have start in 1850. Um, but the, the temperature change between 1750 and 1850 is very, very small and actually the emissions of um, CO2 over that time are actually quite small as well when you consider the, the cumulative emissions since then. But is there an issue of the baselines we, we've used? So I think if you, if you look at the, the different tables of numbers between the two reports, um, there are differences. The, ba the base periods that we're using are different. You know, we used 1986 to 2005 for present day now. Previously, we used 1980 to 1999. But there is some discussion of that in, our, in my chapter, actually, and it, it sort of goes through it and says, if you account for all these slight changes in, in periods, um, the projections are very similar. So the models are giving really similar answers to what they did in the previous report. Okay, but now that... You, just one addition there. You might not believe that although it sounds like it doesn't really matter, 750, 1850, and paleoclimate data shows there's only a 0 0.2 degree difference at max, uh, etc. Um, is it really that important? And believe me or not, 50 governments, maybe 10 of them very active, spent two nights in Stockholm just on that point about what is pre-industrial and should we say 1850 or 1900 or 1860 to 1899 etc so it was one of the most contentious points in Stockholm um, between the governments the background to this is for example Brazil why is Brazil interested not to have pre-industrial in there because it cuts into the political discussion of when does climate change start for what part industrial countries are responsible. So they would not like to see a redefinition by the back door that pre-industrial now is 1850 rather than 1750. 
Um, others, like the scientists, say, well, we have the observational data from 1850 onwards. That's where we can make confident statements uh, about. But 1850 is a very good proxy for pre-industrial. But that is then, again, not reflecting the concerns of China and Brazil, because they don't want to see a proxy that is 1850 for something that they consider 1750 onwards, etc. So sometimes it's commerce that governments fight about. Sometimes it's something like that. that uh, a whole negotiation um, can spend two nights about. Now you're getting into uh, politics, Martin. We're not supposed to be doing that tonight. The gentleman here. Yeah. Hi, Andrew Longmark from Beyond Zero Emissions. Uh, I just would like to know what's the potential for reduction or increase even uh, in short lived forces like methane to influence the probability of us uh, achieving longer term targets? Can you, get, can you just, just a bit slower? Sorry. Sorry, bit, just bit clearer uh, if you would. Sorry, on the, on the uh, potential of increases or, uh, or decreases potentially in emissions of shorter lived forces such as methane or even others like black carbon uh, to uh, change the probabilities of us um, achieving longer term targets. So I think the question is, yeah, the short lived species like methane. Um, and so in those targets, they, the warming from those is accounted for and that was the reduction in the budget that Scott was talking about. Um, I don't know, Morte, if you want to add to that. Uh, yeah, the, there has been a great discussion over the last years about the short-lived forces and how much they would help us in reaching the two degree target or closing the gap in 2020 in terms of where we have to be with our emissions and where the projections are. And so the key point here is um, that short-lived forces, by definition, they are short-lived. They don't affect temperature by the end of the um, century. They are not useful to stay below two degrees. They are useful for reducing local air pollution. They are useful for preventing, for example, black carbon deposition on snow and glaciers. They are useful for reducing the warming rate in the near term. But by and large, um, a focus, or if you want to achieve stay below two degrees, then your focus now has to be on long-lived gases, which is CO2 um, and others. And the closer you are to these two degree temperatures, the more you can as well address the short-lived forces. And this comes out in a number of studies, including those assessed now in IPCC. Okay, young lady in the front row here. Hi, um, my name's uh, Shona Candy, and I'm from Vale at the University of Melbourne. Before I ask my question, I'd actually like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which, in which we meet tonight and pay respect to elders past and present and future. Um, my question is really very quite short and it's related to something that's quite close to my heart. I'd like to know what a two degree temperature rise will mean for future food production. We might be getting into Working group two again, but. Um, you'll see a lot more about that in the working group two report in, in March next year. Um, look, in, in general, I, I don't think I can answer precisely to, in relation to a two degree warming, um, but what you generally see with grain production with, with future, future warming is that. Um, uh, with some small amount of warming in the mid latitudes, you get some increase in, grain, in, in food production, but you don't see that in the tropics. Almost any warming from now on is, is more of a negative than a positive when it comes to tropical food production. Um, and as you get to higher levels of warming, um, which I think are probably levels above two degrees, more like three degrees, then you start to turn around the mid latitude food production into a more negative state of affairs as well. There are no plant physiologists at the front table here, but we're hearing a little bit now in our media that, of course, CO2 is a fertiliser. Is that, that anyone want to make a no comment, or is that way, are you going to say it's way out of your space? CO2 is a, does have a fertilising effect on plant, plant growth, but that's really taken into account in, that, in what I was just saying before. Okay. Gentleman down here in the fourth, yeah. Oh. 
My name is Robert Nolan. Um, with your models, is there any evidence that uh, we might have an increase in volcanoes? And if we do, what would be the effects of that? Would it be better or worse? Volcanic eruptions uh, can have a profound influence on the climate system, as we saw in some of the slides that I put up. But there's no, uh, we don't have an ability to predict what they might do in the future. So, yes, it's um, possible that we will see the influence of climate, but we don't know what the timing will be, and we don't know what the magnitude will be. Thank you. And i just add that volcanic eruptions are really short-term effect on the climate, so you'll see that drop in temperature of a degree or so for a year or two, but that it springs back up pretty quickly. Gentlemen at the top. Um, my, name's, my name's Tony Gleeson. I'm, in, I'm interested in finding out uh, what it, how angry each of you that, that what the science that you're producing is being completely ignored by the politicians. As I'm asking you as um, your silent, scientist hats off for a while if you can. Uh, Neville, I, I, I might roll this into a, uh, uh, a Twitter question. Uh, and I had you tagged to answer this. The, the, the Twitter question from MB is, did the negative media coverage of the leaked IPCC report before its official release damage key messages that the final report was trying to convey? Perhaps you can yeah. make a response. Okay, yeah, yeah. thanks for that, that question. Um, I, I think the media in Australia sometimes get a bad press. Um, <laughs> I, How often? I, I wanted to say that. I've worked hard at rehearsing that. <laughs> I, I, I've dealt with science journalists and environment journalists for uh, 35 years. They have a tough gig, I reckon, um, because it's okay for us. Like, we've spent all our lives dealing with climate science and writing incomprehensible reports for the IPCC. <laughs> journalists have about three minutes to actually assimilate all of that and produce um, a thousand words. Um, and Generally, I think the media, overall, in a global sense, do a pretty good job, eventually, of conveying the message. And um, sometimes they write articles that um, have misunderstandings or mis misconceptions, and that I think it's been our duty to actually try to help them out, and, and, and some of my colleagues still do that. Um, but generally, you know, they, some of it's actually pretty good. And, um, but, but to address the... Um, uh, the gentleman's question more directly and get back to the media is uh, if you read The Australian there was a lovely cartoon on Saturday that's the day after the IPCC report came out by John Kudelka um, I bought a copy of it uh, an original of it and it's called None So Death and it's got a caricature of an IPCC scientist unfortunately right and starting back in 1990 and then a caricature of him at a microphone just like this um, we're talking about uh, results and it's a male is wearing a suit. Um, I don't know what that says about IPCC. But the other thing it says about IPCC, he's got a full head of hair at the start and at the end uh, is, is as bald as I am. Um, so he starts in 1990, there's a little caricature of him and the message in 1990 is, so this climate change thing could be a problem. Then second assessment, 1995, climate change, definitely a problem. 2001, I've forgotten what 2001 he said, 2007 he says, look, sorry to sound like a broken record, but, and then 2013, for the AR5, we really have checked and we're not making this up. <laughs> and then the crunch is he goes to 2019 and I needed to be close to the microphone because he goes, tap, 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 is this thing on? <laughs> now, I think that gets to the heart of this, this question, I think. Um, and sometimes we feel we don't get this message across as well as we can. But I, generally, I've talked to a lot of politicians over the years, and some of them are willing to listen. Um, and I, I think the world is getting there. Um, so it depends what side of the bed I get out of in the morning. But, Neville, but I, Neville. I'm, I'm optimistic. Just on about. behalf of the audience, just on your first answer to the question, so what doesn't Andrew Bolt understand? Sorry? What doesn't Andrew Bolt understand? 
doesn't oh, seem to be getting it this way some science journalists. I find so. Andrew Bolt quite entertaining. <laughs> Malte, um, uh, with your indulgence, folks, we're going to go five minutes over. We're, we've already reached our nominal conclusion time. Malte, make a comment. Uh, you know, sometimes you see the scientific coverage that there is an anti-correlation between the amount of Murdoch papers and um, how well si climate science is represented in the general press. Um, the, but to underline the point that was first uh, here um, made with tap, 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 is this microphone on. Um, this carbon budget that was presented as well as one of the new things in AR5. Well, there was a study in 1978 that estimated we can burn 10% of the known fossil fuel reserves without getting into a trouble zone. That was 1978. 35 later, years later, we are sitting here. Tap, tap, tap. Is that microphone on? Gentlemen, uh, yes. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Paul Matt. I represent Australia and New Zealand Geoengineering Protest. Um, I'll draw your attention to page 21 of the report. Uh, the final paragraph talks about geoengineering uh, as a tool to uh, mitigate climate change. Um, we believe that geoengineering is already happening on a large scale uh, in a covert fashion in the world. Uh, stratospheric aerosol injections, um, commonly known what the street term is, but chemtrails. Um, these, are, these are out there, people are documenting these every day and recording them. Scientists in, in the geoengineering community talk about using um, chemicals such as aluminium, barium, strontium, uh, highly reflective nanoparticles to create uh, the solar umbrella, solar radiation management. Um, we're seeing these chemicals represented now uh, in the soils, in the waters, people are doing hair and blood analysis tests and uh, finding very, very high levels of, you know, aluminium, barium, strontium, etc. So, um, what are your thoughts about geoengineering? Uh, do you have a positional statement on it? Are you aware that geoengineering is already happening in the world and that, uh, that it's not being advertised by governments globally? Could I? Neville? Can I take that? Um, I think a lot about geoengineering. I, I teach geopolitics of climate change and a large part of that is what should we do about geoengineering? It's got major governance issues, major problems with international law, but it is happening, I agree. Um, I'm not sure about the examples you use, but I certainly know that uh, uh, ocean fertilization experiments are taking place and many, many proposals for geoengineering. Is it going to continue to happen if it's start already started? Is it going to happen? Um, if I can uh, steal a, a comment by John Holdren, who was the science advisor to President Obama, and elaborate on, on that or embroider a bit more. He said, well, I, I'm saying, using his words, you can do four things about climate change. You can mitigate, that's reduce emissions. You can adapt. You can geoengineer, that's my addition. Or you can suffer. My feeling is we'll do all four. And geoengineering has major issues because of governance and how you actually regulate it. If a small island state decides to do stratospheric injection of aerosols, who's going to stop them? Gentlemen on the aisle at the back. And if you can get a, a microphone to either the gentleman with the red top or the gentleman next to you, you can toss up who wants to ask a question. We've only got time for one of you. <laughs> gentleman here on the aisle. Um, in the beginning of the presentation, we saw a comparison with uh, current carbon dioxide concentrations versus over the past 800,000 years. I was just wondering how confident we are in our representation of past climatic conditions. Ice cores. How confident are we of the concentrations of CO2 in the last 800,000 from your graph, Scott? Yeah, I think there's a statement that gives the author's estimate of the confidence, and I forget the exact wording, but it's something like very confident. But uh, please read the report to get the exact words. <laughs> I wasn't being facetious, that's what it says. Yeah. Either of these gentlemen up here. Yeah. Hi, I was just wondering whether the impact on, like, of warming on the capacity for the ocean to absorb CO2 is changing, and how you think that's going to impact um, future emissions uh, and warming. 
Julie? Um, there is an assessment of that in the report, um, which I don't have it at my fingertips at the moment, but I think there is a lot of discussion from the Earth system models of how much the carbon uptake like in the Southern Ocean will, will change. Um, and that could be a really important feedback to the climate system um, and to the projections being larger than, than what we were already saying. We can take one more question from the floor. Neville, quick couple of comments about adaptation. We talked about it earlier, we've kind of run out of time. Do you want to just cover off a couple of things around adaptation, sort of, you know, future projections and how we might, we're going to have to adapt. You've mentioned it sort of briefly. Yeah, I mentioned already that I'm, I'm sure adaptation is going to be part of the, the, of, of the way we will react to climate change, and we already are. Like, um, since 2003, when there's a massive heat wave with massive uh, mortality in, in Europe, most cities in at least of most developed countries around the world have been developing heat wave alert systems to, in an attempt to actually make sure that doesn't happen. Now, that has benefits now, even before, even if we don't get any further climate change. It has even more benefits in the sense of what in the context of, of global warming and it's those those systems which got we've got one in Melbourne and Victoria uh, they are ones under development in the rest of Australia too they're already saving lives and they'll save lots of lives but they won't save everyone's life that would be lost from this global warming so adaptation is an essential tool uh, in our, our weaponry against climate change but it can't do it alone without mitigation to actually slow things down um, it's very very difficult for us to attack even in what's really quite a simple area that more human mortality related to heat is actually not too hard to actually think about what you might do when you get to sort of protecting infrastructure uh, in the context of a, of a continually warming planet that's actually much harder to adapt to and it really is difficult if we don't mitigate that's going to be tough. And we'll have to wait till April next year to hear the IPCC's conclusive uh, thoughts on that. Last question from the gentleman here. Uh, my name's Craig Allen. Um, of the uh, emission scenarios that um, you looked at before, which one most closely um, resembles our current uh, emissions trajectory? And where does that eventually get us in 300 years time? Real reality. Multi, multi? Well, currently actually our emissions are most closely tracking the highest scenario. They are not above the, uh, way above the range, but they are tracking the highest scenario. However, the follow-up question that we might then have, does that tell us something about the 2100 temperatures or the long-term projections? And that is only to a very limited degree because the next highest scenario today is the one that turns out lowest in 2100. Um, so the RCP 2.6, which you saw here is sometimes in blue color, that is the second highest scenario today. And the two middle scenarios, they are a little bit lower. So we have sort of fluctuations in the human emissions. We can hope that the um, for example, the changes in uh, the <coughs> on the east coast of China in terms of clean air pollution mechanisms, they will potentially bring Chinese emis emissions down, and then we are suddenly tracking the lowest scenario. But there is a si relatively limited amount of um, projection that we can just do because currently we are that scenario, that scenario in terms of where we end up in 2100. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll agree with me that we've had a wonderful insight into uh, uh, a massive piece of work in this uh, latest assessment report from the IPCC. Would you please thank our five panellists, Scott Power, Julie Arblaster, Neville Nichols, Penny Wacky, and Michael Nelson. You can all go to the uh, website there on the screen, www.climatechange2013.org, to find out more about uh, the to explore the IPCC further. Uh, as I say, we anticipate uh, that AMOS will be having uh, functions like this again as the next two 
working group reports are released uh, in the first half of next year. Uh, thank you again to our partnering universities and institutions for your great support in promoting uh, public awareness uh, of the latest climate change science. Uh, we look forward to more events like this and you can go to the AMOS website to find out about those. Uh, if you'd like more information about AMOS, it's available, I think, on the information table outside. In fact, you can join AMOS if you'd like to at a special reduced rate. Uh, anyway, thank you all for being with us. Good evening.